Welcome to our visitors, wherever you are, Annex and all the rooms. I took a stroll over there just a moment ago, and the presence of the Lord just as real in the Annex as is here in the main auditorium. We welcome all of our visitors. We trust that the presence of the Lord has been manifested here today in, in a measure that you have uh, been blessed, and uh, we welcome you. <clears throat> now, for those who are downstairs, remember through Annex 8 and 9, or rather through Exit 8 and 9 here on the main floor, go to the ancillary building, and in the Annex, go to room 204. The ushers will show you where to go after the service. Our visitors, we'd like to have you visit there and get a free book and a tape and meet some wonderful New Yorkers. And there's some refreshments also. We just want you to be uh, made very welcome here in Times Square. New York City this past year has had 34 million visitors, 34 million, the highest in record, and they're expecting more. And uh, we're glad we're right here in the middle of it all to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. So pray for us as we pray for you. Amen. Turn around and just look at somebody behind you and say, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And mean it. <laughs> Hallelujah. We love the word of the Lord here, Times Square Church. And if you look around, you find that anybody who attends Times Square Church regularly has their Bible with them. We bring our Bible and we go into the word and we study it. And we just love the word of God here at Times Square Church. My message today Roll away the stone. This is not an Easter message. This is an everyday message. Roll away the stone. Now, Father, we come to the word with great awe and respect, reverence. We come to you, Holy Spirit, asking you to anoint us. We ask you to make this word living and life to us. We pray, Lord, as you gave it, that you would bring it forth, expand it. Lord, we take the lows and fishes in our hands, and we ask you to break it, and we ask you to feed us, and we ask you, Lord, to make it a sufficiency, and that everyone in this house will be touched and moved by the Holy Spirit, and this word will linger for weeks and months ahead. They'll never forget, Lord, what they hear from your word and from your spirit. Lord, when the spirit makes the word life, we never forget it. And we pray your blessing and anointing on the word in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about obedience and the new covenant. Obedience and the new covenant. Now, let me refresh your memory, those who attend this church and those who are visiting. In Hebrews, the eighth chapter, you don't have to turn there, but the writer refers to two covenants. The first covenant is called the old covenant. And the second covenant is called the new covenant. In fact, the writer in Hebrews, in the eighth chapter, calls the the covenant that God made in Mount Sinai, the first covenant. And so in Hebrews 8, there are two covenants or agreements that God initiated for the benefit of mankind. The old covenant was made at Mount Sinai. The new covenant was made with Christ when he came to this earth. And God initiated it for the obedience of those who have a heart desiring to obey. But there was a fault with the first covenant, the old covenant. God said, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, we believe that the true Israel are the born-again saints who walk by faith. We are the Israel of God, the Israel from above. We believe God has his own covenant, a covenant of the land, a covenant of mercy with Israel. But the true Jew, the true Israel, are those who are in faith in Christ Jesus. We are the true Jerusalem, we are the true Israel, and so these covenant promises made to Israel are made to the church of Jesus Christ. Now, under the terms of the old covenant, God demanded perfect obedience to all his laws and commandments. The scripture says, now therefore, if you will obey my voice, this is under the old covenant, God said, if you will obey my voice indeed, and you keep my covenant, then you shall be a, pe a peculiar or special treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. 
And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, why is it that God demands perfect, absolute, total obedience from his people? Now, I'm convinced, absolutely convinced that you cannot obey God until you understand why he demands it. It's impossible for any Christian, no matter how pious you may be, it's impossible for you to obey God unless you understand his motive. You understand why he wants you and me, in fact, demands of us total obedience, both under the old covenant and under the new covenant. Is it because God is a tyrant and he just uh, demands it for his own pleasure? Is he getting some kind of pleasure, putting a heavy yoke on his children? That's not what the Bible says. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, and my commandments are not grievous. Obedience on our part has little to do with pleasure for God, has not for his pleasure. The pleasure God gets out of our obedience is the fruit and the blessing it produces in us. He's the loving Heavenly Father. He is not a tyrant. He is not trying to satisfy something in his own nature. He's satisfied with himself. There's nothing you, can I, you and I can do to make him any more satisfied with his glory than he is. So the matter of obedience is that it produces such fruit. It produces such blessing in our heart. He gets his blessing out of seeing us be blessed as a result of our obedience. This is how we bring pleasure to his heart, just like a father who delights in seeing the obedience of his child and how it produces the fruit in his nature. That's how our Heavenly Father delights in it. The Bible talks, Paul in Philippians talks about being filled with the fruits of righteousness. And he said that right after saying that you may be sincere and without offense. He said, in other words, if you obey God, you're going to be filled with the fruits or the blessings of that righteousness or that obedience. I can prove that to you conclusively in the scripture this morning. Now, for Israel, under the old covenant, <clears throat> the, the, the blessings that resulted were primarily material <clears throat> in nature. He said, but if thou shalt indeed obey my voice and do the, all that I speak... I will be an enemy to your enemies. I'll be an adversary to your adversaries. He said, if you will obey me, I'll bless your bread. I'll bless your water. I will take sickness away from thee. And in Exodus 13, 26, if you will obey me, there will be no barrenness in your land. He said, I'll make you fruitful. I will bless you as a result of your absolute obedience to me. I demand obedience for a purpose. It is to bless you. It is to give you my favor. It has nothing to do with my being a dictator in the cosmos. It has to do with God desiring his blessings upon his people, and there's no other way to receive them. Now, all God's laws in the Old Testament, you read all the laws and all the commandments, page after page, having to do with washings, having to do with... with uh, Hygiene having to do with rest days, having to do with cleanliness. <clears throat> all of these laws of washing the hands and the pots and the pans all had to do with God's desire to keep them from being wiped out by the diseases of Egypt and the heathen around them. It was God's plan to protect them. And they chafed under the very laws that God had intended to cause them to survive. He said, I'll not let any of these diseases come upon you if you just obey my laws of hygiene. Folks, that goes the same today. If you're not going to wash your hands before you eat, you're going to let people cough on your hands and not going to wash them. You're going to get a cold. You're going to get the flu. There are laws and they are meant for our protection. The law was holy, the Bible said. The law was for their benefit, and they chafed under these laws. The, the, these, the, this demand for obedience was meant to bring the material blessing also. He said, I'll bless your cattle, I'll bless your vineyards, I'll bless your crops, your weather, your clothing, your homes, and I'll give you personal security. Those were all the results 
the blessings of obedience. But there were also some very powerful spiritual blessings that came from obeying God. Folks, you don't hear much about obedience in these days. We have a lot of preaching on grace. We preach grace in this church. But not to cause any believer to ever consider that he does not have to obey the word of God. God demands obedience, even a more powerful concept of obedience under the new covenant. But see, under the old covenant, there were also spiritual blessings. I want you to go to Exodus, the 40th chapter, if you will, please. And I want to show you a powerful truth having to do with the covenants of God. The 40th chapter of Exodus. Obedience results, listen to me, obedience results in the bringing forth of glorious manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Obedience under Old or New Covenant results in bringing forth glorious manifestations of the glory of God and the presence of the Lord. Verse 1, chapter 40, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month thou shalt set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. Now look at me, please. Look this way. Here is the word of the Lord that came. Here is the commandment. Here is the law. The Lord says, I want you on the first day of the first month. Now, he got all these details on Mount Sinai. He had received a clear word from God, word for word. Moses, I want you on the first day of the first month, I want you to set up the tabernacle. And if you go on further in that text, you will find the Lord spake unto Moses saying, set up the tabernacle. It's going to be started the first day of the first month. He said, you're going to put the in place the ark. You'll find that in the next 15 verses or so. You will bring in the table, the showbread table. You'll set in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. You will bring in the candlestick. You'll set up the altar, the laver, the hangings. You'll anoint the vessels and you'll pour oil on the ministers. And he gave every detail on how to pour the oil and how to anoint. Word for word instruction given to Moses. Verse 16, thus did Moses, according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. Folks, listen to me. I picture Moses going in and out among the workers as they're preparing the tabernacle of the wilderness. Every detail had been given by the Holy Spirit. And I see Moses going to one of the workers on the brass. And one of the workers says to him, this socket is not large enough. In fact, I found another way to make it work just a little bit better. And Moses says, you'll not do it. That was not according to the mind of God. That's not the instruction I received from the Holy Spirit. Now, remold it. He goes over here now and they are dyeing the wool for the veil. And one says, we can't get the proper color of blue. It's just a little light and it looks better. It fits in better with the other colors. Moses says, dip it in the dye again. It's a deep blue. We will not divert from the commandment of the Lord. Not an iota. The Lord said it. I will do it. Moses was not obeying God for reward. Moses was obeying God because he was a servant of the Most High. He loved and he reverenced his heavenly father. He said, I will not do anything contrary to what I have heard from the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of the Lord that spoke to him on that mountain. <clears throat> but I want you to see what results from that obedience. Verse 34 and verse 35. So, verse 33, so Moses finished the work, everything in divine order. Then, when? After he had obeyed God in every detail. He made no excuses. He took no shortcuts. Everything was in divine order. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud 
abode there, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. You know what happened? The Holy Ghost took over. The Holy Spirit took over. And what he's saying to Moses, what he was saying to Israel, what he's saying to every one of us today who want to obey God, the Lord said, I will show you what happens when you walk in obedience. Let me show you what I will do for you. I will come down and I will take over your life. I'll take over direction because along with the glory came the cloud. That's the moment the cloud descended by day and the fire by night. And the Lord said, from now on, you don't have to make a decision of your own. You move with the cloud. When the cloud moves, you move, the Bible said. And so they moved only with the cloud. In you, the purpose of obedience, the reason God wants you to obey in all things that he says to you, according to this book, line up to the word of God, obey it. Don't disobey it at any point. The Lord said, because I want to reward you. If I see you listening to me, if I see you doing what I ask you to do, it is for your benefit, is for your, it is for your favor and your blessing from heaven. And if you'll do that, I will manifest my glory in your life. Everybody will sit and I'll lead you. I'll guide you. Hallelujah. Talk about blessings and fruit of obedience. The Holy Ghost was so pleased. He came down and took over. Moses couldn't even minister. Well, I've had that happen sometimes in my life where I get up to preach and halfway through the Holy Ghost said, you can sit down now, I'm taking over. And God did more in, in, in his 10 minutes than I, I did in hours and hours of preaching. But I could sit down and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There was some divine order. You, you brought divine order in my life and you have shown me your blessing. Hallelujah. I'd rather have that than... Ten million dollars, honestly. If, if you want the glory of God in your life, you taste it every time you obey. If you want the glory of God in your life and the presence of Jesus, you taste it every time you obey. And it increases as you keep on obeying. Now, under the new covenant, God demands even a stricter kind of obedience. And for the same reason, we are his children, and our Heavenly Father knows the dangers and consequences of disobedience. He knows the consequences. He knows the danger. Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, said, We were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Then he went on, he said, As you know, we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Do you know what it means? He said, we charged you. In the Greek, it means we gave you a tongue lashing. We spanked you with the word. We used the word as a rod. And he said, we did it because we loved you, because it's a, it's a father who cares. We know the consequences of disobedience. It's just like a father. Why, why does a loving, godly father take his teenage son aside. He just learned to drive. And he said, now, son, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to let you drive the car, but you're not to go over the speed limit. I want you in by 12 o'clock. You're never going to come in after 12 o'clock because as long as you live in my house, you're going to be here by 12 o'clock. And I'm not going to allow any music in this house that has filthy lyrics. And there'll be no pornography either on internet or films in this house because this is God's house. Now, why does the father do that? Because he's just trying to be lorded over his kids? No, he knows the danger. He knows the consequences and he says it and he says it emphatically because of love. And he says, don't ever try to outrun a train at a railroad crossing. And, and suppose he gets a call one day, the father and the boys in the hospital all banged up and somebody's been terribly wounded. And the boy has hidden the fact that he was speeding 95 miles an hour trying to beat a train at a railroad crossing. Why would that father not chastise that boy? Not to get even with him, 
Not to vent his anger. But he says, you have not learned. I am going to take away your keys. You will not drive a car for another year. And as long as you're in this house, you're not even going to get out till 10 o'clock. After 10. You said, that's harsh. No, 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 no. But you see, when these laws are laid down by a loving parent, and especially teenagers come and said, well, now, wait a minute. You're treating me like a child. That's not fair. I'm old enough. I can handle it. And I want to tell you something. That child will not obey if it's chafing against those rules meant to protect his very life. Meant to produce blessings in his life. To produce character in him. If he rebels against that, if he has the spirit of rebellion, he's always going to try to sneak out. He will never obey his father. He will just try to do it without it being without being caught. And if he obeys, it's only because he fears discipline. It's only the child who truly loves his father. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. This is love that you do my commandments, First John, or Second John 8. Only out of love. If you obey God simply because you don't want to pay the consequences, you know that you might be exposed. You know that your sin's going to find you out. That's not enough motive. That's not going to keep you. That'll keep you for a while, but you're going to go back until finally you want to be exposed because of the burden you carry. You still there? In the New Testament, you find some of the Lord's even most devoted ones questioning the call to obedience, questioning the word that they receive from the Lord. They loved him, but so often they said, oh, yeah, but Lord, but Lord, but Lord. For, for example, Peter, he's in a trance on the rooftop, a flat rooftop in Joppa. He's waiting for lunch. And in this hungry state of mind, God moves in a vision. And he sees a, a, a sheet embroidered on the edges lowered to him. And that sheet is full of unclean animals, not kosher for the Jew to eat. They're unclean. And the law said that they dare not eat any unclean animal. And the word of the Lord comes, a commandment comes, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord. You know, Peter's saying, Lord, but Lord, you've got to be mistaken on this. Why would you ask me to do something against your decree? Why would you ask me to do something your law is already forbidden? I can't do it. And evidently, he must have shaken this off as if, well, I'm, I really didn't hear from the Lord. We do that when something comes we don't like. That had to be flesh. That was just my mind. I had too much to eat the night before. And we tried. Holy Ghost is trying to get through. He's trying to say something. And we are. But Lord, but Lord. And there's sometimes you, you, God will tell you some things that are not contrary to scripture, but you just don't understand. You can always find a convenient scripture to counteract it. <clears throat> Taken out of context. The Lord sends down the sheet again. He said, Peter, get up, kill the animal and eat. He shook it off. The Bible said three times, three times. And even after the third time, he's coming down the stairs for lunch, and he's still doubting. And there at the door are some messengers from the house of Cornelius inviting them to a Gentile prayer meeting. It had been unheard of. The Gentiles were without the covenants, and, and, and uh, the Jews didn't even touch, didn't even eat or associate with the Gentiles. But the Holy Ghost came upon, upon Peter. And the Holy Ghost, <clears throat> and to him the Lord said in a vision, or, or, or rather, the Lord said to him, I want you to go, Peter, to the house of Cornelius. Go with these men. But do, do, you, under, do, you, do you see what I'm trying to get at? Here, here is Peter saying, but Lord, th there wasn't that immediate answer to the word of the Lord. The more you delay disobeying, that clear voice of the Lord, the more difficult it becomes. Let me give you another example. Ananias. 
Ananias, the Bible says, the word came to him in a vision, and he said, Behold, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Ananias, arise and go to a street called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one who is called Saul of Tarsus. Then Ananias answered, Lord, and here's the but, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to the saints in Jerusalem. The the word is clear. The Holy Spirit came and said, you go. Gave him the address, gave him the name of the man and the house in which he was abiding. You couldn't get any clearer details than that. Folks, the Holy Ghost isn't vague. If you want deliverance from sin, he will never be vague. If you truly want to obey, God's Spirit will speak clearly. There'll be no fog in it. The only people who get muddled messages are those who have a muddled determination to quit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he said, but Lord, I've heard of this man. He's the man. That's, he's, he's a killer. Can I just pray for him here? Is this trip really necessary? Oh, can I write him a letter? Anything but this, because he was afraid of this man. But I want you to know that both Peter and Ananias put aside all their questions, all their fears. They said, he said it. I believe it. I'm going to do it. And they obeyed the Lord. They determined that they would go at any cost. The Spirit of the Lord, the moment that determination was made, the Spirit came upon Peter. Rise, therefore, get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing. What happens when men of God obey the Lord's voice, the Holy Ghost? What happens? What happened with Moses when he obeyed? The glory of the Lord came down. The Spirit of the Lord fell. What happened when Peter went down to the house of Cornelius? Listen to what the Spirit said, what the Bible said. While Peter yet spake, he's speaking to Cornelius in his household, while he still spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word. There it is again. Obedience produces a manifestation of the glory in the presence of God. And Ananias goes and prays with Saul. The Bible says he received the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came down in that room, filled him and opened his eyes, healed his eyes. And folks, you and I today are still benefiting from the obedience of these men. In every case, there was a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. People talk about revival. People go everywhere trying to get a little touch of fire in their bosom. Folks, I'll tell you what, it's only when you've got your house in divine order, when you've got your life in divine order and you're obeying the Holy Ghost and everything he says, not then, not until then will you have a true manifestation of the Holy Ghost in your life. Everything else is sugar-coated candy, cotton, froth. It vanishes. Two months later, you're back down where you were because you are not obeying the Holy Ghost. Hmm. Let me give you another ex- example of questioning God's word, and, and this by the Lord's own disciples, his very own disciples. In John eleven seven, 7, Jesus turned to his disciples and he gave them the word. He said, he, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. His disciples said unto him, Master, but Master, the Jews of late have sought to stone thee. And you're going to go thither there again? You're going to go thither again? He said, but Lord, this doesn't make sense. The word is clear. The Lord said, we're going to Judea. Now, Lazarus is dead. They're going to, to, to the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And these disciples, can you, can, do you hear the tone of these men? Lord, this is foolishness. This can't be done. They'll kill you and they'll probably kill us in the process. But see, they're questioning the word of the Lord. They're questioning it. 
Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. Would you go to John 11, please? Beloved, I want to tell you something. There is nothing on the face of this earth that will set you and I free except the word of God. The word of the Lord. Nothing. But just just leave it open in the, to the 11th chapter, and I'll tell you where to go as we go here. The four, verse 14, then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Then Jesus says something very profound, very profound. Verse 15, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. You know what he said? I'm glad I didn't go when they called me. He said, I have a reason for delaying. Has nothing to do with Lazarus. Has nothing to do with Mary and Martha. It has to do with you. My disciples, to the intent that you may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. You know, the, the, Jesus had said, we, we, first he said, we're going to go because Lazarus is asleep. And you know what the disciples said, don't you? They said, well, he's better off than we are. Let him sleep. Why bother him? Any excuse. Jesus plainly said, no, Lazarus is dead. And I'm so glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that you may believe. And you know what he's telling his disciples? I'm about to bring you face to face with the greatest impossibility you've ever seen in your life. I am going to bring you face to face. Now, they'd seen people raised from the dead who'd been dead a day or hours. They'd never seen anybody raised from the dead who'd been four days when the body would have decayed. He said, I, I, I'm going to put you face to face with the greatest impossibility any human being could ever face. And I'm going to show you folks that that impossibility at that tomb has to do with your besetting sin. It has to do with that one issue that God's been dealing with you that is, has entombed the revelation of the glory of God in your life. We're going to see that unfold here in just a minute. Follow me closely. In the Greek, unbelief and disobedience are represented as the one and same word. Let me give you an example. Don't turn there. But in Hebrews 3.19, it says, So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. The children of Israel didn't go into the to Canaan land because of unbelief. In the next chapter, Hebrews 4.6, They to whom it was first preached, entered not in because of unbelief. It's the same word, but it has a different root. And the root of 4, 6, the word means disobedience or unpersuadable. And what it is saying, what, what it is very, very clear in the scripture is that the fruit of unbelief is always disobedience. The fruit of unbelief is disobedience. The fact that you are disobeying God in one area in your life. You're disobeying. You've questioned his word. He's told you clearly time and time again what to do. This has to go. And he keeps dealing with that. But the the very fact that you've not had the, the faith produces this disobedience in the life. This is brought out in the reaction of Martha when Jesus comes on the scene. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. She believed that God could raise a half-dead man, but not a full-dead man. That's where most of us are. We believe God can do it where there's still a little inkling of hope. God's going to bring you into a place in your life where you are going to have to be face to face with absolute impossible situations outside of God's miracle power. Do you know Ananias at first didn't believe that this man could be changed? Peter couldn't believe that the Gentiles could come into the covenant promises of God. The disciples doubted that God, Christ, could protect them from the Judeans who wanted to stone them. And here is Martha questioning him. In every instance, there, there, there is no faith in God doing the impossible in their lives and situations.
Now we come now to what I want to call the crisis experience. The crisis experience in obedience. Now the new covenant demands absolute total obedience to the word of God. Every word that proceeds out of his mouth. They are not grievous, but folks, he demands absolute obedience. And the reason he can demand it is because he's made every provision in our lives to have all the power and resources we need to obey. He's not asking us to do anything he has not provided for. In the new covenant, obedience is provided for by the indwelling power of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost has been given to us. It was not given under the old covenant. There were times the Spirit would move on people. There were manifestations such in the time of Moses and the tabernacle and Solomon when he built the temple. But they did not have this daily walk with the Holy Ghost. You and I have the Spirit of God abiding us. If you were saved by faith in Christ, that had to be the work of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit had to be in you to reveal Christ. He said the Holy Ghost is given to those who ask. Have you asked the Holy Ghost to come and abide in you? When the Holy Ghost comes to abide in us by faith, folks, that indwelling power of the Holy Ghost is every resource, everything we need to obey God at every point in our life. Every word of this book. So that it's not our striving, but the ministry of the Holy Spirit in us. The crisis comes when you've been dealt with by the Lord about something that is holding back the glory and the blessing of God in your life. There is not the fullness. You, you live with guilt and fear and condemnation because you know there's, there's this one issue the Holy Ghost is dealing with. This one issue could be a besetting sin, could be covetousness, could be a, a driving ambition. It can be sexual problems, it can be lust, it can be temptations, so many, many things that Christians carry year after year and they never enjoy deliverance from the bondage and dominion of sin. And they live in misery because the Holy Ghost is persistent. He's saying, I have to have that. It's got to go because it's blocking and hindering the flow of my covenant blessings. He's saying, now, if you really want to be free, I've made a way. I've made a way. See, this crisis comes when God, by his spirits, knocked down all the excuses. The excuses are all gone. And the Lord keeps saying, obey me in all things. You're not living according to my word. And that's why you don't have order in your life. That's why you don't have order in your home. And folks, I'm going to tell you again, he has every right to demand full obedience because he supplied all the power to obey. He said, if you through the spirit do kill or mortify all the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. Do you know what it means to live? When God says you shall live, that means you're going to live. You're going to live free from guilt. You're going to live free from bondage. You're going to be set free. He said, you'll live. A lot of Christians aren't living. They're existing. What is it that's locked up in that tomb as Jesus approaches it with his disciples? You say, Lazarus? Let me tell you the two things I see locked in that tomb. Even though in the spirit you may be outside here with Jesus right by your side, locked in that tomb is this, is the flesh under bondage, chained by the death of sin, the stench of sin, hopeless. Also in that tomb represents your full revelation of Jesus Christ, new resurrection life. It's entombed. Because there's a stone rolled at the door. And folks, you can go through life keeping your revelation of Jesus entombed. It's there. The Lord is there with the word ready to bring it forth. He's more anxious than you are. But he says, 
Roll away the stone. That stone is nothing more or less than unbelief. According to the covenant, the new covenant, the only things that stands between you and total victory and freedom from all sin in this dominion is unbelief. Nothing else. You don't need to make promises. You don't have to say, I won't do it again. That's not what God wants. God wants you to roll away the stone of unbelief. Mary said, but master, by now he stinks. He's been dead four days. And that's the word that we hear from people, but this thing is laid so, it's been so long. The stench of this in my life, it's been so long. It's there. There's no hope. I'll be hooked as long as I live. I've tried and tried and tried. It's impossible. And so there's no revelation of Jesus. There, there, there's no hunger for the word of God. There's no divine order. Because unbelief has entombed the revelation of resurrection life. Placing that tomb all wrapped up in unbelief. And the Lord comes to you today in the Holy Ghost and he says, do you want to be free? Do you want deliverance? I've made a covenant with you. I have made a covenant. Roll away the stone. Get rid of the unbelief. That's within your power. That's within your ability. That's the only thing that you and I can do. That's our part in the covenant. What else can you do but believe? Jesus said, didn't I say to you, if you would believe, you shall see the glory of the Lord? There it is again. The glory of the Lord comes because you believe. And that is the demand for obedience. All that God demands of you and I for obedience is faith. Roll away the stone. God didn't send angels down to roll away that stone. He could have spoken or anyone who could call a dead man out of a tomb could surely roll a stone by a thought. He said, you rolled it away. And the Bible said, they rolled away the stone. That's your part and it's my part. You roll away the stone. When you roll away the stone, you will hear his command. Lazarus, come forth. The moment you believe that God has the power for the impossible. You said my sin is so embedded in me, it's impossible, it's been there. I've been chained by death for so long. God said, I promised you that if you will believe, you will see the glory of God. And the glory of God is victory over sin, released from the tomb, and the revelation of new life that comes from him alone. If you will believe, you will see the glory of God. You know what they, uh, Jesus, they brought to Jesus a man in a bed who was crippled up and he said, sorry, your sins are forgiven. And the Jews said, only God can forgive sin. And you know what he said? Which is easier to say your sins forgiven or take up your bed and walk? And he said, take up your bed and walk. And he walked. You know what God's saying? How is it that you can believe me? What's easier for me? To, for, to save your eternal soul through my blood? Or to say to your sin, enough, be gone, be healed, be delivered, come out of your tomb. Which is easier? God said, if you're going to believe me for your eternal salvation, and you believe me, I've forgiven all your past sins. I want you to go to that tomb right now, he says, and move the stone away, and I'll speak the word. You just give me faith, and I will bring you out of that tomb. I will take away all of those bandages, and you'll leap, and you'll dance with new life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Beloved, what a grief it must be to the heart of God that he sent his son to bring such freedom, to open every tomb, to raise every dead man and woman. What a, what a pain it must be to the heart of God that so many Christians do not enjoy resurrection life. 
And that's the purpose of the new covenant. Lord, so yes, you'll obey me. And when we don't, there'll be chastening. But he'll just keep coming back and coming back out of his great love. Until he says, look, I'm going to keep bringing you to this tomb. I'm going to keep bringing you to this stone. Until you roll it away. I don't care how long you've been in that grave. I'm telling you, I serve a God. If that man had been in the grave 10 years, he could raise him. Because when Jesus came out, remember people had been dead for years, came out and were seen on the streets of Jerusalem. With God, nothing is impossible. God said, I want to, this is the, the, the heart of the, the heart of the new covenant. I want to be God to you and I want you to be a child to me. I want you to be my son, be my daughter. I want that father, son, daughter relationship. Now, I want you to believe that nothing, nothing is impossible. There's no sin in your life that I can't help you conquer by the indwelling power of the Holy Ghost. Now, folks, don't, don't expect the Holy Ghost to instruct you how he's going to do it. His ways are past finding out. Just accept that he is there. Take that by faith. The Holy Ghost abides in me. He can do it his way. I'm just going to trust him to do it. He's got a million ways to do it. Things that you couldn't even conceive in your mind, the Holy Ghost will do it. Your part is to just say, Holy Ghost, I receive the word. I believe you with all of my heart. I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to fear this thing anymore. I'm going to put it in your hands. I'm going to seek you, Holy Ghost, with all my heart. I'm just going to worship the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask the Holy Ghost to do his work in my life. I'm going to cast myself in the bosom of the Holy Ghost. No, he's faithful. You hear a word behind you. He said, I'll give you my spirit and cause you to walk in my ways. Hallelujah. And you will not depart from me. I accept that. I believe it. Hallelujah. Roll the stone away. Will you stand? Forgive me for getting so loud, but man, God wants us to be free. I want you to be free. Now, let me tell you what the Holy Spirit spoke to me about the invitation. That many of you, balcony, main floor, and in the annex, in the main annex and some of the rooms in the annexes, Many of you came to this service this morning with that sense of death because you don't have the victory in your life. You're still struggling and you're fighting a losing battle against the besetting sin or something that God is dealing with in your life. I'll tell you something. He's not mad at you. He's saying that has to go. Because I, I want to bring into your life resurrection power. I want you to know me like you've never known before, known me before. I want to give you all my spiritual blessings. God said, I want to write my law in your heart. I want you to know me like you've never known me. Nobody will have to teach you. I will teach you. Everything you hear from the word. When he says, I will teach you. There are people coming, they, they hear messages, but even though somebody else is teaching, the Holy Ghost is not teaching. It's going in one ear and out the other. He said, when you hear a pastor preach, I'll come and I'll teach what he's teaching to you. I'll make you understand it. Is what he said. I'll make you understand the word. I'll make it life to you. And he said, I'm going to be merciful to your sins. I'm going to be merciful to you. I'm going to send my Holy Ghost upon you and you're going to walk in my ways. If you're here this morning... You've got that cloud over your head. You say, I, I have that sense, David, Pastor David, God's been dealing with me and I want victory today. I'm going to come against that stone of unbelief in my life. And I'm going to ask God's spirit to help me just roll it away. He'll even do that. He'll come and give you the faith that you ask him for. Remember the man who came and said, help my unbelief. Jesus helped his unbelief. I want you to get out of your seat. If you don't know Jesus, if you've backslidden, if you've been running from God, 
in the, in the annex, go outside to the lobby. The ushers will show you the door into this auditorium. And you come down the aisle, come here and meet me, and I'll pray for you. And up in the balcony, go the stairs on either side, you come down any aisle. Move in close, make room for those who are coming. Now, to walk in the Holy Spirit and to become sensitive to his voice, you've got to give him time. That means if you feel a temptation coming on you, if you feel you're drifting toward doing something that's contrary, you know, to the will and the word of God, stop immediately and consult the Holy Spirit. Consult him. There'll be a, a word in you. He will come. He is faithful. If he didn't come when you called, he wouldn't be God. He wouldn't be the Holy Spirit. He will come. He'll not let you be deceived. And I'm going to tell you, you say, Lord, should I go there? Should I do this? Lord, I'm about to do something that I know is sinful. I don't have the power to resist the Holy Spirit. Will you come right now? And I'm telling you, he will come. The problem is we race ahead of him. Because we know what he's going to say. We shut him out. We just shut him out and we go and do it. And then we get the guilt and the fear and condemnation after. The Holy Ghost doesn't put that on you, but that's from your flesh and that's from your conscience. So if you're going to walk in the spirit and if you want him to be, if you want him to give you that cloud that leads you, that inner voice of the Holy Spirit that will not deceive you, you've got to give him time. You've got to love the Lord with all of your heart. You've got to get into his word because that's where faith comes from. Faith comes, the Bible says, from hearing this word. You read it and you hear it in your soul, and that builds up your faith, and that gives you the power to roll away the stone. You've got to have the muscle, and this gives you the muscle to roll away the stone. And you get that stone out, say, I believe God. And every time doubts from the devil come and fear comes to you, say, God said it and I'm going to stand on it. The Holy Ghost is in me. The Holy Ghost is my helper. The Holy Ghost is my comforter. The Holy Ghost is my strength. He's my strong tower. And speak the word of faith. Speak it out loud and say, Jesus, I believe. Holy Spirit, I believe your power. Deliver me from the bondage of this death. That's what Paul said. Who shall deliver me from the bondage of this? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Hallelujah. The spirit of God is the spirit of Jesus Christ. That is Jesus. Now, if Jesus were still here, he would probably be living in Jerusalem. And, and with, with uh, how many billions of people on the face of the earth? What chance would you have getting five minutes with him? If, 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 he, if he were on earth... If he were living today and he lived in Jerusalem, what chance would you have? You couldn't afford to get there in the first place. And if you wanted an audience, and, and what could you tell him in five minutes? Because you've got, uh, you've got uh, a couple, uh, you, you've got a billion or two Chinese in front of you lined up. And you've got Indians and you've got them from Africa. You've got them all over the world and they're lined up. You can't do it. But that's why he sent the Holy Ghost. So his spirit could be everywhere at one time for all of us. And he's available. Everything you would have gotten with a interview with Jesus, everything you would have gotten with him putting his hand on you, say, let it be done, is done now by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's the spirit of Jesus spread abroad in all of us. We're one body. Hallelujah. We believe him right now that Jesus is right here by his spirit. I want everyone that wants freedom and roll away the stone. I want you to just lift up your hands to the Lord. By the way, I want you to lift your hands to God. That says, I surrender. Pray this prayer with me right loud. Jesus, Jesus. I come against my stone, my unbelief, my unbelief. And, I cast it out. and I cast it out, and I roll it away, roll away. in the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. my Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior. Jesus. Jesus, I have no power. I have no authority, but you have it, Holy Ghost, and you abide in me. I cast my life and my care and my future into your hands. Jesus, cleanse me, forgive me, and heal me, and release me. Now in Jesus' name, I speak the word, the word that Jesus spoke. To the dead flesh in me. In Jesus' name. 
come alive. Every sin, every habit, be gone in the name of Jesus through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now you thank him in Jesus' name for his power. You thank him for his authority. I give you thanks, Jesus. I give you thanks. I give you praise. Hallelujah, Holy Ghost. Raise your hands and tell him you love him right now. Lord, we love you. You have power. You have authority. Holy Ghost, come down right now and speak the word of faith. Roll away the stone. Lazarus, come forth in Jesus' name. Victory, resurrection, life, come forth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Do you know when they took the the bandages off of Lazarus? I don't believe he went around just shaking hands with everybody say good to be back. I believe he danced all over Bethany. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. You see, when everything's in divine order, that's when the Spirit of the Lord comes and he imparts joy. His work is as a comforter. He will do his work in you immediately and start comforting you and telling you it's going to be right. Just follow me. It's going to be right. You're going to have my life.